Hello and welcome everyone to this edition of the uh, Permit CAE webinar series, where Vera Pancaldi from the Cancer Research Center of Toulouse in CERN will talk about data-driven modeling of intercellular interactions in the tumor microenvironment. My name is Marta Llorel Linares, uh, and I'm involved in, the, in Permit CAE on behalf of MBLEBI. I'll be hosting this webinar. And um, before we go any further, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording afterwards on our website and YouTube channels. We will have some time at the end of the presentation uh, for questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, please write them down on the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, all the materials from this webinar are licensed under a CC BY uh, license, except where further licensing details are provided. Permit COE is the P HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. And it focuses on simulations of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omics data into medical, into <coughs> medical action. Um, the performance of current simulation software is still insufficient to tackle certain medical problems, such as tumor evolution or patient-specific treatment. So Permit COE will scale up a cell-level simulation software to the current HPC systems to enable the creation of uh, models of cellular functions of medical relevance. And Permit COE will achieve this through a series of objectives. The first one is to optimize uh, selected cell-level cell simulation software to run in pre-exascale platforms. Second, Permit COE is developing a series of use cases to demonstrate the application of Permit COE solutions in certain areas of clinical relevance, such as drug synergies for cancer treatment or multi-scale modeling of uh, COVID-19 uh, virus and patient tissues. Permit COE will also train biomedical professionals in the use of HPC exascale Permit COE tools and in integrate the personalized medicine communities into the European HPC exascale ecosystem and build the basis for the sustainability of the Permit COE. Today's presenter is uh, Vera Pancaldi, uh, who was trained as a physicist and soon found her way in systems and computational biology. Since 2018, she leads a computational biology team at the Cancer Research Center of Toulouse, working on modeling cancer and its interactions with the immune system. Her main current focus is understanding the relationship between genome architecture and the heterogeneity at various levels, and relating heterogeneity in the phenotype of tumor infiltrating immune cells to patients' response to immunotherapy. So Vera, the floor is yours. So uh, hello everybody, thanks so much for this uh, great introduction and uh, thanks for allowing me to uh, participate in this uh, excellent seminar series. I will tell you a little bit about my work on modeling um, interactions in the tumor microenvironment. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. So um, again, we're going to be talking about uh, data-driven modeling. So we are interested in making models and really starting from data uh, to establish um, patterns of interactions between cells that are important to understand the uh, tumor um, mechanisms and tumor dynamics. So this is just an overview of the talk for today. First, I will try to justify why I think we should model the tumor microenvironment. This is a very recurring acronym. And then uh, I will try to describe um, some um, ways in which we can describe the composition of the tumor microenvironment. I will then pass on describing how we are considering spatial aspects and finally consider dynamic modeling. So why modeling the tumor microenvironment? Basically, my main um, uh, reasoning is that we know that patients are all different. We know each one is different uh, from our neighbors, our family members. But when patients are arriving at a clinic with uh, cancer, they tend to be treated in the same way. And we are really against that because we realize that treatments should be different. However, it is interesting to think about why patients are different. And this, I think, can be simplified into two main sources of variability. 
On one side, there are uh, variabilities that are due to the characteristics of the specific cancer cells that the patient harbors, and this can be related to the tumor genotype or phenotype. But on the other side, I think there is a great source of variability that comes from what I call patient history. And this is basically the characteristics of individuals that were there even before the tumor started developing, but they inevitably impact what is going to happen once the patient gets the cancer. So this is where the tumor microenvironment comes in. And the tumor microenvironment is essentially an ecology of cells that include cancer cells, but also some immune cells and also other normal cells, uh, healthy tissue cells, uh, fibroblasts and other components of uh, healthy tissues. But basically the myeloid and lymphocyte compartments are two opposite forces that we have in our immune system. On one side, the lymphocytes, we can simplify a bit the story and say that they are the good guys that are supposed to go and kill the cancer cells and protect us from uh, you know, uh, the terrible effect of cancer. On the other side, unfortunately, some of these myeloid cells that are a different type of immune cell will also infiltrate the tumor microenvironment and actually protect the cancer cells from the action of these lymphocytes. So this battle um, is actually very important because we have some new therapies in cancer that are referred to with the term of immunotherapy that actually uh, act by protecting our individual organism against the cancer by reinforcing the lymphocytes activities in killing the cancer cells. This is of course a bit simplified, but just to give you a context and a, um, an idea of what we're talking about. So these immunotherapies can be very successful in certain patients, and they have given hope to many patients that were considered incurable until very few years ago. But unfortunately, the success rate is still about 30%, and this really depends on which cancer type we are considering and also which patients. And we don't really understand how we can predict which patients will respond well to these therapies. So this is the main motivation. And this is why the focus of the talk will be the tumor microenvironment. As I said, we abbreviate it as TME. And this is a picture, of course, uh, um, a sort of a pictorial representation of what the tumor microenvironment might look like with all the different components that are uh, especially rich of uh, immune cells. And we will concentrate on this for um, the next part uh, of the talk. So basically the way we can identify which cell types are present are multiple, but the most common are either looking for markers that are on the membrane of uh, the cells. So basically we have some proteins that we can identify and based on the presence of these proteins, we can basically identify the cell type. But we also have gene expression data that all of you probably know. And gene expression can help us also identify the uh, types of immune cells that we have in front. So just to give you an idea, this is a, a slide of a, a lung tumor. And basically we have performed multiplex immunofluorescence with a few markers so that the different cell types are highlighted in different colors. Here we have blue for all the cell nuclei, uh, white for macrophages and a green marker for cancer cells. So basically when we started thinking about how to describe and model the tumor microenvironment, we considered two approaches. Imagine that we have a piece of tumor, so a tumor sample. On one side, what we can do is extract RNA or DNA from this sample and actually using some methods uh, that we call uh, deconvolution. It's basically a, a statistical way to estimate the proportion of uh, cell types that are making up uh, this complex sample. We can basically count how many cells of each cell type are present in the sample. So we have done some work on that. We have developed some signatures that are uh, trying to capture the presence of specific cell types. And I will discuss a bit briefly uh, how we can do this. But essentially, these methods can work pretty well, although we have a very big problem with benchmarking because we don't really know what is the real answer. It's very hard to know the exact composition of the sample. On the other side, we thought that because the tumor is such a complex uh, environment, we don't just want to know who is present inside, so which cell types, but we also want to know where they are and how they are related to each other. So we have taken an imaging approach which allows us to uh, identify the presence of cell types based on these markers. This is a pictorial representation of the fact that we can identify markers on the protein uh, on the surface of these cells. 
And basically what we do is that we transform these annotated images into networks. And I will describe why this uh, is interesting. And so we have developed some tools to go from these uh, images of tumor samples all the way to networks. So starting from the description of just the components of the tumor microenvironment, we have used either gene expression or DNA methylation to infer proportions of the different cell types. This involves having some uh, signatures that are basically fingerprints of the different cell types that are contained in the complex sample, in the bulk sample. And we have designed uh, some of these signatures starting from different databases, including the Cancer Genome Atlas and also Blueprints, that was a very big European project to characterize uh, the phenotypes of different types of immune cells. Once we have these signatures, we can use different types of methods and perform this estimation of proportions of all of these cell types. So essentially, the signature is a gene list with some values associated to each gene that represent a fingerprint of a cell type. And then once we have this deconvolution technique, what we can do is benchmark our own methods with our own signatures against uh, other methods, but also against the ground truth. Unfortunately, the ground truth here is hard to identify. So basically, the composition of a complex tumor sample is not so easy to ascertain. And on one side, if we think about doing this on blood samples, we can use facts. So this is a typical way to identify markers that are present on the cell surface. And we can do this for liquid samples quite easily and recognize the proportions of uh, cell types that are making up uh, the blood in this case. For uh, solid tumors or, or tumor samples, it is a bit harder to do that because the fax isolation, um, so isolating the cells to perform fax is not always that simple. And so there are other methods, and one of them is using imaging-based estimates of the composition. So this has been applied to the cancer genome atlas samples, and so we have a, a rough overview of how many cells of each type are present in the samples. Finally, of course, uh, we are in 2023, and it is now very common to have single cell RNA-seq data set that will describe uh, in detail the transcriptome of each cell coming from the sample. And so ideally, we can just generate the ground truth by counting how many cells belong to a specific cell type category. However, uh, I won't hide that uh, generating this data still has biases, because just like for facts, we have to isolate the cell from the tissue and this has different effects depending on the types of cells, so nothing is perfect. So uh, since nothing is perfect, we decided to start at least benchmarking the methods one against the other. And on this uh, slide, I'm showing you some results of a benchmark we have performed using some single cell RNA-seq uh, from melanoma samples that were also profiled by bulk RNA sequencing. So this is a, a complex slide, but all I want to say is that on the um, rows here, you have the different methods and different signatures to perform the convolution, which is also represented here. And on the uh, horizontal, so on the columns, you actually have the different cell types that we have tried to quantify. The bottom line is that there is no perfect method that will work no matter the signature course. There is also no perfect signature because uh, different um, methods can work better or worse depending on the signature and the different signatures depend on what you're interested in finding. So it depends on uh, the amount of detail with which you want to identify the components. And also there is hardly a consensus on the composition because there's a very big difference between the results you obtain with different methods and signature. And unfortunately, combining this with the fact that there is no clear ground truth composition makes it very hard to choose a method. So I put here a reference of a, a paper that we have been working on where we are um, comparing the methods. And also we use uh, these methods to at least generate some features that we then use to predict patients' response to immunotherapy. I will not get into details about this, but if you're interested, that's the reference. So I said at the beginning that what really interests us is the spatial context. Uh, obviously, knowing who's at the party doesn't tell you who's talking to whom. So we started going on this other um, part of the project, trying to characterize the relationships between cells initially uh, given by their spatial distribution. So for doing this, we decided to use a network-based analysis um, to extract from an image a network that will basically have nodes corresponding to cells 
and edges or links uh, uniting cells if they are in contact with each other. And you have here a reference because we have developed a, a Python package that performs this quite efficiently. And it's quite important that the software is efficient because these images can be very large. So um, obviously everything is relative, but uh, the processing power is uh, quite uh, substantial and the efficiency of the methods can have an impact on whether the methods can be useful or not. So this is Tisserand, which is the package we have developed. This is work from Alexis Coulon in my lab. Um, he has now left, but we hope to keep collaborating. And basically, he has developed this, um, uh, this tool to extract networks from images uh, that can represent uh, some spatial omics data. So we have actually applied this on uh, multiplex immunofluorescence, but also spatial transcriptomics by TechFish, spatial proteomics by Mivitov and Kodak. It's a pretty general framework. And the idea is that it starts from an image, it segments the image, uh, it then basically performs all these different types of um, calculations to identify the relationships between the cells and reconstruct a network. And then this network can obviously be used as an input into other tools that are used to perform uh, analysis uh, in, uh, in, uh, um, in accordance to what you're actually trying to do. So uh, we have here um, a new version of Tisserand, which actually works on uh, 3D images as well. But I'll let you discover this uh, in the paper, and I'll just explain how we can use this. So basically, one example is a project we had in pancreatic cancer. We also work on lung cancer, but uh, I thought of explaining this using uh, this example for today. So basically, what we can do uh, by using network theory is extract tissue networks from the patient samples. And these networks will keep the information about patterns of interactions between cells. And just to explain why we want to do this, basically, on one side, we can cluster patients based on these features. And on the other side, uh, in a slightly more um, you know, future prospect uh, way, we can make ensembles of these networks that will be uh, useful to initialize models that can represent these patients without being a specific copy of what is in the patient sample. Because we know that uh, patient samples are very heterogeneous and we will never be able to capture all of the patient sample in one model. And we don't necessarily want to simulate all the details, but we need to capture some statistical properties. So basically, we start with pancreatic cancer, which is unfortunately a very deadly disease and so little progress has been made in the last few years or even in a lot of years. Unfortunately, it's still a very, very important uh, unmet medical need. We have some uh, immunofluorescence data on some uh, uh, samples from pancreatic cancer patients. We then perform cell detection and marker quantification because this immunofluorescence allows us to identify cell types based on these markers. And then we do this network reconstruction. So once we have this network, one thing that we are really interested in doing is identifying spatial patterns. And to start with, one of the spatial patterns we look at is the presence of clusters of cells that belong to the same cell type. So for example, here you have a very simplified version, but you can see that on this uh, left example, you have a good mixture between cells of different types, whereas on the right, you see that the cells of the similar colors are clustering together. We measure this with a concept called assertivity. It's just a very simple network measure. But when we do this, we can reconstruct what we call a mixing matrix that determines both the probability that cells from the same type will be interacting with each other, but it also tells us how probable it is that cells from different types will be close to each other. And this can lead us to identifying patterns that involve different cell types. So once we have done this mixing matrix, what we can do is turn it into essentially a feature vector for each one of the samples. And so what we can do is have here a heat map where we have patients as rows and different spatial features in columns where the features are essentially the elements of this mixing matrix. And by looking at the different patterns in space for each sample, we can cluster patients and identify subsets of patients that have similar properties. Of course, the interesting part is then to connect these uh, clusters of patients to clinical data and potentially identify patients who will respond to therapy, patients who are at risk of relapsing, or anything you might want to understand about your patients. We could think about uh, differences between uh, sex and gender. We can think about uh, the age of patients. 
Essentially, it's a way to extract information from these images. Now, oops, I went round the other way around. So the second part of why we want to do this is to create network ensembles that will basically preserve the statistics that we have extracted from these patients. And this will be useful to generate um, the inputs to models that can then simulate what happens inside the tumor microenvironment. So why do we use networks? A little bit of justification there. I think networks are very useful because we can make analogies with other topics, either in biology or as far as social sciences. And there are many tools that have already been developed to study them. On the other side, what I like about networks is that they give you a statistical description of uh, the system at hand. And so you can go beyond asking is this T cell close to the cancer cell. It's more a global estimation of spatial patterns that are either present or absent uh, or can be quantified indeed. And the other thing is that extracting these networks allows us to preserve the spatial context, but it is more efficient than looking at the images themselves. Now, of course, uh, there are arguments against that, and now there are many methods based on deep learning that will just take the images as they are, and of course, those are complementary and very useful as well. And the other thing is that we have other applications of network theory that uh, have allowed us to recycle some of the tools we have developed. But this talk is about dynamics. And so what about the dynamics and the simulations that we can make of the tumor microenvironment? So to study dynamics, we have to take a step back because as you might imagine, a complex tumor sample is uh, complex. And this means that we cannot easily have access to all the information that we would require to make a dynamic model following all the cells, where they're going, what are their phenotypes. So we started going toward the simpler system. And in fact, we studied an in vitro model of leukemia. So leukemia is basically blood cancer. And in this case, we are talking about chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. Uh, and basically in CLL, inside the lymph nodes of the patients, you have a very high accumulation of cancer cells that are um, creating uh, the environment for monocytes that are normally circulating in the blood to uh, start being under the influence of these cancer cells and differentiate into nerve-like cells. Now, this might seem a bit confusing because in CLL, uh, people call these nerve-like cells. In fact, they are basically tumor-associated macrophages, which are macrophages. So these are cells that are normally sensed to um, eat uh, dead cells and, and uh, protect us from, uh, from a pathogen. In this case, uh, the tumor-associated macrophage or nerve-like cells actually act in protection of the, cancer, of the cancer cells in the CLL. So this um, in vitro model is actually something that we have been working on in collaboration with Martin de Magala, Marie Pau, Jean-Jacques Fournier, and Loïc Isvaer, who is the CLL uh, clinician who basically provides us with the samples and has a lot of expertise on that. And the reason this is interesting is that the monocytes that are the circulating uh, cells in the blood can differentiate into macrophages, but the type of macrophage they produce will depend on their environment. And in the presence of the signals given by the cancer cell, that, well, by the cancer cells in CLL, they actually form these tumor-associated macrophages. Now, of course, this is important because in solid tumors, like we have described before, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, we also have the presence of these tumor-associated macrophages. And if you remember the first slide I showed you, these macrophages can actually be some of these myeloid cells that prevent the good action of immunotherapies in patients. So we started working on this system and what we wanted to do was capture dynamics. So we started with a co-culture of monocytes with CLL cells, and we let the culture go for a few days and observe the formation of these macrophages. They are bigger and they attach to the plates. And basically, we can then study what are the phenotypical changes that take place during this time course. So on one side, you have here an image of uh, the macrophages and the CLL cells in red. And you see that the CLL cells basically attached to the macrophages to receive this protection that uh, is normally provided by them. Considering uh, the fact that basically the monocytes will not turn into macrophages in the absence of cancer cells, this is already quite a complicated system, as you can imagine. We then characterize these cultures by FOX, so by looking at the proportion of cell types present, and also by single cell and bulk transcriptomics. From the bulk, we can perform deconvolution, but you will see that from single cell, we get also a lot of information. 
So just to um, describe a little bit more uh, these uh, TAMs or NLCs, we know that essentially these types of macrophages uh, can be seen as just macrophages, and we're not sure that these are really cell types that are different from one another, but we know the phenotypes are different. And here you can see a PTA of the expression of the different types of macrophages compared to monocyte. And so you can see that definitely there are phenotypic shifts uh, accompanying uh, the uh, protection of the CLL cells in this assay. So our main aim was to develop a dynamic model. This is just another overview of the experimental data that we have collected. But then we want to uh, perform a dynamic simulation, and we have divided this into two sub-problems. So on one side, we have an agent-based model that we think is going to be ideal to simulate what happens in terms of interactions between the different cells. So we have cancer cells, we might have CD8 T cells, and we also definitely have myeloid cells, especially monocytes that will basically turn into these macrophages of different types. So I will start by describing this, and then the second part will be on trying to describe what happens inside each one of these cells. Once we will have done this, if we can put together this agent-based model together with a Boolean model that I will describe about what happens inside the cells, our main goal is to make an integrated model of tumor-associated macrophage formation. So to go back to the details of the agent-based model, we basically have an in vitro culture. PBMC is just blood, so don't, don't be scared by this term. It's just circulating blood. And basically, we can take uh, monocytes from a specific patient and put it together with cancer cells from another patient or from a donor and from a patient. Or we can simply cultivate culture in vitro, the blood of CLL patients that already contains monocytes. So what happens in this culture is that the monocytes will differentiate into NLCs or macrophages or TAMs in contact with the cancer cell, with the cancer cells, so CLL cells. The CLL cells would normally die if it wasn't for the presence of the NLCs. And we have actually done cultures where we do not put the monocytes and we just observe the, the death of the CLL cells. In fact, if there are NLCs in the culture, they help the CLL cells, sending them anti-apoptotic signals that are things that can be exchanged between cells. And so we observe a rescue of the CLL cells. At the same time, and this is very important, the macrophages can eat apoptotic and dead cells, and this can affect the viability that we calculate at the percentage of living cells, so that we can see an increase in viability that can either be due to the fact that the cells don't die, or to the fact that the dead cells are being eaten away by the macrophages. So, okay. So um, in this figure here, you have an example of uh, some of our cultures. And in the panel C and D, you have some time forces uh, for different patients. So each point uh, is a patient at a specific time point. And so we can follow the dynamics of the proportion of CLL cells that can be uh, measured in the culture. Here is the viability, and here is the concentration, which also gives you an idea of how many cells are actually in the culture. So uh, basically, we have performed some imaging, but we haven't really focused on that for the moment. We look at the time courses of viability and concentration. And then basically what we have done is we also collected some information about what would happen if we changed the quantity of monocytes in the initial culture. So this we had to do in a slightly different system where the monocytes are not uh, directly in the blood of the CLL patients because there are some technical limitations to doing that. But I will explain that. So this is our agent-based model that is currently based on NetLogo. And basically it simulates the interaction between the different cancers, uh, between the different cells, so cancer cells and the myeloid cells, and all the different processes that take place. So on one side, the differentiation of the monocyte and the changes in the state of the cancer cell, but also the phagocytosis that is taking place when macrophages eat the dead cells. So um, what we can do with our agent-based model, of course, is first uh, specify the parameter values, because you can imagine that an agent-based model has a lot of parameters. Essentially, each one of these um, interactions requires a certain um, parameter to, to be defined. And obviously, for some of these parameters, we have some ideas of their values, but from others, we just don't know. So we have performed a genetic algorithm parameter search that is based on trying to fit our model with experimental data. 
the details are in the paper and I don't want to go into too much uh, detail here, but basically we are using uh, optimization of two fitnesses, one on viability and one on concentration. And so we end up with a Pareto front and then we have to decide what to do with this Pareto front that is going to tell us which combination of parameters ensures the best fit between our experiments and the simulations in our model. So we have different options and obviously different options in the parameters leads to different simulations. You can see the simulations here in red, uh, superimposed with the data. You will not fail to notice that there's a huge uh, variability in the patient samples and we will come back to that. But essentially, once we have a model for which we have established some parameters, this is not the end because the models can only be useful if they can make predictions. And so far, we haven't actually predicted anything. So that's when we started looking at this data that we have collected where we changed the concentration of the monocyte in the culture. And this is where we can really test that our simulations can match more or less the experimental results. And so we know that the model can be used to make predictions. So what are the main problems? Well, basically we started doing this with only four patients. We then were able to add another five patients for a total of nine. But the more patients we added, the more patient variability we saw. And so we decided that it was a bit um, uh, difficult, if not impossible, to optimize parameters that would be working for all the patients. So we decided to reduce our, our, our hopes and actually try to get a model that would be patient specific. However, the idea is that going from patient specific to uh, patient classes will help us make this model useful to make some predictions. Because of course, if we have to make a new model for each patient, what's the point of making the model? We already have all the data and that's what we wanted to simulate in the first place. So what we did is that once we had optimized the models per uh, patient, so each patient comes in a set of parameters, we want to look at how the patients uh, distribute on a PTA of these parameter values. And we saw that uh, luckily the patients seem to basically cluster in two groups. And we have observed that these two groups essentially identify two classes of patients. And this has recovered some, um, uh, you know, some uh, known uh, phenotypes that are uh, identified in this Domagala et al. Uh, 21, uh, 2021 paper, where they have identified the fact that some of these patients develop protective thumbs or NLCs so that the viability of the cells is rescued by the end of the time course. But other types of patients, other patients do not develop this type of protective cells. And so the CLL cells actually die. So we are hoping that this approach of trying to make the models patient specific at first and then looking at how the patients look like each other and going back to clusters of patients can help us be um, you know, useful to the clinics in the sense that we might be able to make predictions for specific classes of patients because unfortunately biology is complex and we've realized that probably a single model will not be able to give any prediction of any use for all patients. So going back to the second phase of the modeling uh, framework, we now have a model that describes how different cells interact with each other, but we are also interested in knowing how the cells are regulated, uh, how the phenotypes are regulated inside each cell. So to do that, my postdoc Malvina Marku has actually been working on extracting, uh, well, on, on um, deriving a bullet model of this formation of NLCs from monocytes. We started from uh, literature, uh, because initially we had some data, but we found that data-driven modeling was complex. So we are still in the process of doing that. But by looking at literature, we were able to um, create a, a Boolean model of this formation of the tumor-associated macrophages or NLCs. And this is based on a model that was already existing that explained how the macrophages could be polarized between two different states. And essentially, we added a third state that was the one that the macrophages um, end up in when they are in contact with the CLL cells. So this model, of course, also has to be tested. And so the first test we could perform are um, uh, derived by putting specific stimuli in this Boolean model and observing that the production of cytokines was correct, uh, depending on what we would have expected in a, in a, um, a wet lab experiment. But as for the agent-based model, the main issue of making a model is to be predictive. And so what we can do once we have this in silico model of the um, thumb formation 
is try to play with knockouts and uh, constitutive activation of the different components of the model to see if we can identify some strategies to prevent the formation of these NLCs. So this is all published work, and I really invite you to look at uh, the paper and uh, the repository where you can see all the details of that. Moving on, uh, what we really wanted to do was use data-driven modeling. And so we went back and started to collect data to try to perform this uh, modeling from the data. So we actually have the same type of culture, but this time we are performing RNA sequencing at many time points. In this case, we did an 11 time point time course to capture the dynamics of the different genes. Um, currently, we are working on this data. This is really a work in progress. But basically, we have collected the RNA-seq data for two patients. We have now performed a similar experiment with four more patients. And what we are trying to do is infer uh, transcription factor regulatory networks. This is a bit cryptic, so transcription factor gene regulatory networks using different techniques. And we have actually started by writing a review on the different methods that are available because unfortunately that doesn't seem to be a single perfect solution. And then uh, once we have uh, inferred a regulatory network, uh, we would like to validate it by looking at whether, you know, all of these TFs that are, um, uh, you know, identified to be part of these cascades are actually uh, known in CLL biology. And we basically want to understand how these different methods are compatible or comparable with each other and whether we can extract any biological insight from that. As for the deconvolution problem, validation can be difficult because it is very difficult to assume that what has been seen in other cells, for example, or in other conditions can be directly applied. Now, the next frontier, of course, is single cell. And we have a very, very good motivation for going towards single cell because, as I told you, in these cultures, the macrophages stick to the plate. They also stick to the TLL cell and they also eat the TLL cell. So when we are looking at bulk transcriptomics, we always have a bit of a mess. The vast majority of the cells we think of will be TLL, but we are interested in knowing what happens to the macrophages. So to be able to capture that, we actually decided to do single cell uh, sequencing. So we have taken again blood from CLL patients and we know that despite the fact that 99% of the cells are CLL, um, there will be traces of T cells, NK cells, even neutrophils, but unfortunately in most of the protocols they are eliminated. We made a huge effort to, to put them back into the culture. And of course there are monocytes because we know that during time these monocytes will turn into these tumor associated macrophages that protect the cancer cells. So we are using a technique called uh, CyteSeq. I forgot to put the reference, but essentially it's a way to measure in single cell, the transcriptome, and also markers on the cell surface uh, using antibodies. We have used about 20 antibodies. And so we can capture during the time course the exact composition of the culture and the phenotypes of each cell in each of the cell types. So from there, we can infer transcription factor activities. We can infer, hopefully, gene regulatory networks specific for each cell type. We now have only five time points, not 11 but we think that it should be enough to be able to infer these models um, and understand more about the phenotypes and how they're evolving through time. We can also study cell-cell communication. This is something that we will do in the future. We haven't done it yet, but we know that from single cell data, we can essentially study the lingon receptor interactions that are present. And hopefully this is going to help us infer a robust model of uh, um, phenotype evolution inside the different cells, as well as interactions between the different cells in the culture. And uh, ultimately, this is going to allow us to uh, infer different models for the different cell types. And this will be used to complement the agent-based model that hopefully will be expanded to include not just monocytes and cancer cells, but also T cells and K cells and any other cell that might be important. So we have some preliminary data. This is an experiment that was not easy and uh, putting together the availability of the samples, the doctors, the technicians to do the experiment was not simple, but we managed. So I'm showing here some very preliminary data and there's really no analysis yet. But essentially we have performed site seek. You have here the list of markers that we have used to identify the different cell types. And we have some new maps that makes me feel like uh, we're getting, we're getting there. So we have a, phenotyp uh, a phenotypical um, profile for each one of the cells that can be analyzed as a whole to identify shifts in the phenotypes of the different cells across time. And we also have the markers on the cell surface 
that allows us to actually label the cells with a name because essentially immunologists uh, label their cells by what is present on the on the surface of the of the cell and so we will be able to say at which point for example the monocytes stop being monocytes and start acquiring phenotypes of the macrophages so this is work in process but basically the idea is that what we would like to do in the end is initializing our models as much as possible from the data so on one side, we can take RNA-seq, even bulk RNA-seq samples with deconvolution to initialize the quantity of cells of specific cell types that are present in the samples. On the other side, we really would like to make an emphasis on extracting spatial network statistics from the samples. And I have explained maybe a bit past the fact that we would like to use the networks to make ensembles, because um, I think that modeling in, in heterogeneous systems with the variability and stochasticity needs uh, um, an ensemble approach where we can look at global properties, best and worst case scenarios, rather than just looking for a single answer. And at the same time, I have described how we would like to extract models for each single cell type, inferring them from the data. This is a work in progress, so I don't have any uh, concrete uh, results yet. Now, finally, further perspectives in the future, what we would like to do is really understand how the patient profiles are impacting the behavior of the immune cells inside the tumor microenvironment. Because unfortunately, we know that we can go into a huge amount of detail about what is in the tumor, but whether the therapies work really depends on the entire patient. This can be the immune system, the epigenome of the patient, the genome of the patient, the microbiome of the patient, and all of these characteristics that are impacted by different things, such as aging, different comorbidities, and even life course events, such as stress and, and stressful events, can really affect the response to therapy. And our aim in, in, uh, in our Cancer Research Institute is really to improve therapies for patients. So we think that um, if we are able to describe how the different immune cell properties can be reflected in specific patterns in the tumor microenvironment, we'll be on our way to understanding better how uh, specific patients can respond to these therapies. So with that, uh, I just wanted to summarize. I spoke very briefly about the convolution, but basically our main issue there is that we don't have a ground truth for the composition of these samples but uh, we are making efforts to benchmark the methods against each other and also to identify some uh, samples where we can have some ground truth. Spatial omics are a great resource, uh, both for identifying the spatial patterns in the tumors and also to actually count uh, how many cells of each cell types there are. So we are moving into that, into spatial proteomics especially and, and imaging. Uh, and hopefully this will help us understand better both uh, the single cell aspect and the spatial aspect. Uh, I spoke about gene regulatory network inference, and we have defined a few strategies, but we identified also a problem. We think it is not a solved problem. So we are still working on that, how to find the best tools and, um, and generate data sets that can help us really benchmark them. And also, um, a lot of modeling is often uh, using prior knowledge. Uh, we think this is a great idea, but it might be a bit limited in the case where there is no knowledge about some specific processes that you want to model. So to conclude, uh, patient variability is pretty, pretty uh, enormous in cancer and also in immune cells uh, of, of healthy patients, but especially in cancer patients. And we really think that the host immune cells play a very important role in what happens in the tumor microenvironment. And we would like to capture all of this. So this might be a long term plan, but uh, I'm not giving up just as yet. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my team. So the Network Biology for Immune Oncology uh, team at the CRCT. I'd like to first thank our funding through the Chair of Bioinformatics in Oncology of the CRCT that is generously sponsored by Pierre Fabre, the Fondation Toulouse Cancer Santé, and INSERM. And of course, highlight a few members of the team that have really been instrumental for this work. So I've spoken about the work of Alexis Coulomb on the spatial um, approaches. Uh, we also uh, really rely on Malvina Marku for the modeling, uh, certainly the Buller modeling and also the agent-based model. And Nina Frestrat has actually been fundamental for developing this agent-based model. Julie Bordenab is our wet lab person, the only one in the lab, and she has done all the experiments that I mentioned towards the end. 
And Hugo Chanel is a, um, a student doing his master's and hopefully a PhD soon who will uh, work on inferring these uh, models of regulation in CLL. And Abdel Monim has also joined for the spatial analysis. I also thank all my sponsors. And last but not least, I would like to point out that we have a position open at the CRCT for starting a new team on breast cancer. Uh, the topic is very broad, just breast cancer. It can be computational, it can be biology, uh, but it's really, really attractive because in the startup funds are considerably uh, rich and uh, very similar to NERC. So uh, I really would like you to consider this or spread the word. And of course, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Vera, for your uh, presentation. It was really detailed and clear. So we already have one question in the Q&A uh, section. So how close are the NLC TAM with other TAM from solid tumors, not only on expression profile, but also on function? This is a great question. So um, I personally think they are quite close. We know that uh, in, our, in our collaborators lab, they have been working on an antibody that was identifying TAMs. And uh, it, it works very well with, between NLC and TAM. So we think that if we identify phenotypes related to NLC, they will be relevant for solid tumors. Uh, I should also mention that uh, TAMs are a very broad definition of macrophages. So TAM is essentially anything that is found uh, associated to a cancer in a tumor. Uh, but, but this means that it can be normally identified with an M2-like polarization state, just to go into a bit of detail. Um, but I think there is a lot of variability within the different uh, tumors even. So I think that potentially the difference between NLCs and TAMs of different cancers is uh, not as not bigger than the difference between TAMs of different cancers. This is our hope at least. And there is so little understood about TAMs as far as I understand in solid tumors that I really think we can make some progress at least uh, with these in vitro uh, leukemia based uh, models. Thank you, Vera. So Sunil raised their hand. So Sunil, you should be able to unmute and, and ask your question. I don't hear you. No, no. Otherwise, I'll move on and we'll see if it happens. Uh, so there's a question about positions. Is there a position open for internship? <laughs> so the, the, we do have some positions. The one I mentioned is for a team leader. It's to start a team and have a, really a lot of funding for five years. But if you're interested in internships, uh, get in touch because we have a lot of groups that are looking for bioinformaticians and uh, uh, get in touch. Okay, thank you, Vera. And if the patient variability is high, how to move forward with it without affecting the homogeneity of the results? Yeah, so this is a good question, but uh, saying if the patient variability is high, I mean, it definitely is. No matter what we do, we always see a huge amount of variability, whether it's solid tumors or leukemia. Um, of course, uh, for example, in the CLL thing, we noticed that uh, out of the two patients we had, one was a man, one was a woman. That has a huge, uh, huge impact on the characteristics of immune cells and also on the diseases. So um, unfortunately, I think it is something that we have to deal with. And I think possibly one way forward is what we have suggested, which is to develop models that will be patient specific, but then look at what is in common between these different models. Alternatively, you can make models that try to group uh, all the patients, but it's very difficult to have enough data to really um, capture all the heterogeneity. You know, if we had 200 patient samples, we could do a lot of things. But if I ask my wet lab engineer to do this time uh, series for 200 patients, uh, she'll be busy until she retires. Uh, so essentially, we are a bit limited on that. I think what is also another good, good, good uh, option is to look for data that is easily available, like RNA-seq. You can easily do RNA-seq on many, many patients and try to combine the two types of approaches to, on one side, capture the variability and on the other side, have some deeper data that you can use to identify the dynamical properties. Thank you very much, Vera. So if anyone else wants to ask any question, remember you can write on the Q&A. Oh, there's uh, one having. If your group is actively pursuing tumor ecology studies, Vs and Vs 
microbes. Hope we can get in touch sometime in the future, let's say. Yeah, we, we haven't started that. It's a good uh, good suggestion, but um, we, yeah, we might, uh, we might in the future. So far, we are studying mostly the microbiome uh, in the gut, although we haven't even started that properly. But uh, I'm definitely interested. I think the, the ecology of tumors is extremely interesting and complex, so we cannot really forget about the presence of any of the different elements. So when using data, ethnicity matters or not? It probably does. I, I have to say our, our patients are uh, likely to be not very diverse, but I'm not sure. Um, we, we should probably take care of that. And actually, we are developing a European project now, uh, like at least uh, trying to apply for funds to really uh, leverage the clinical data that we have from all the patients in, in our center. We have uh, over 10,000 patients every year. And we find it, uh, it is sometimes easier to get molecular data than knowing where these patients come from, who they are, what age they are. So we are definitely working in that direction. Okay, I guess that also applies for the last question that came. Also, geographic regions matters in the same. Yeah, I think so. But it is very, if we want to have deep data, it is very difficult to have sufficient numbers to be able to address these things. Unfortunately, they remain uh, part of uh, un unexplained factors due to insufficient statistical power, I would say. But uh, we really hope to capture this data. I'm, I'm doing all possible efforts to convince people to start collecting information and accumulating enough numbers to look at these issues. Thank you, Vera. I have a question about your uh, networks from the pancreatic uh, tumors from the images. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about using them to to inform decisions for patients, you know, in a patient specific way. Is this happening or at which uh, stage is it? You know, are you planning to do it? Uh, soon yeah. or is it... So what we have done so far, uh, it was a retrospective cohort. So obviously we cannot really change what happened to the patients, but uh, we have some evidence that we can be predictive of relapse. Now in pancreatic cancer, there's no immunotherapy and almost all patients relapse. So you'd say, okay, you predict everybody relapses, it's easy. But we have some level of capability of predicting the time to relapse. And this would be important. And also what we can identify is the probability of relapse in patients that are supposed to be cured. So um, we are definitely working on this. We are working on a very nice cohort called uh, Backup. It's a French level cohort. It includes a lot of patients, including uh, the resected patients. And uh, you know there are not that many of those because Unfortunately, PDAC is discovered very late and often uh, there's nothing you can do, so you don't even get the tumor at peace. But in this cohort, we have a lot of data from the clinical side, the epidemiological side, the, the history of the patients is well recorded. We have RNA-seq and we are now collecting a lot of imaging data. So we are definitely making progress on that. I don't have any final answers yet, but um, we are starting some really large projects also with the industry to try and leverage uh, this amazing uh, cohort. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have still a couple more minutes for, for questions, if anyone still has some. Um, there are a couple of uh, comments. Uh, were a great session. I loved it. And thank you. It was a great talk. Thank you for answering the questions. But now in the meantime, so you can still write some questions if you have one, but I'm going to share my screen yeah. a moment. Uh, so we would like to, to share with you that uh, we are already planning some more webinars in Permit COE. So the next ones are on the 22nd of February, interrogating the effect of enzyme kinetics of metabolism using differentiable constraint-based model. And then in March, on the 9th of March, we have supercomputer-based modeling and simulation for advanced biomedical applications. Um, and then we also have a couple of courses. So one is uh, on the 7th and 8th uh, of March in, in Barcelona on introduction to HPC for life scientists. And you can check the PERMIT uh, COE website for, for applications. Uh, and I saw there was some question jumping here. So... Uh, so there is, how is the function of the NK cells? Is it good or bad your presence in the initiation of the tumor? So Vera, you can go with that. Yeah, so we are actually starting to look at NK cells. We haven't looked in uh, detail at our NK cells in the site yet, 
but um, we we think that NK cells can be both. So there are probably different types of NK cells through other projects in lung cancer. We start to have some evidence that um, we really have to be careful with which type of NK cells we are considering. Uh, there might be NK cells that are active and others that are um, resting or maybe even exhausted. So we are actually looking into that. I don't have any answer right now, unfortunately. I thank you. And now that we are talking about cell types, how many cell types can you handle in a in a model? Because I guess there are many different types if you want, but you could. Uh, yeah. Talk. So this is a good question, and I would uh, send it back to Permit COE. <laughs> it depends <laughs> on the supercomputer. So I have to admit that the models we have run so far are tiny. We've never needed a supercomputer, even though we have access to the Barcelona supercomputer. We haven't used it. Um, we have really done uh, something uh, prototype-like so far. Um, of course, with the scientific data, the idea is to really open up to including as many cell types as we think are important. And I think by looking at this single cell data, we will already have an estimate of how many agents we actually need to capture all the dynamics. So we are working with uh, Laurence Calzon and Loïc paul here mm -hmm. in France to try to make uh, these models as complete as possible. Uh, but at the same time, I think the complexity will be reduced compared to what one might think. Because um, in the end, different cells will have different behaviors, but the cells that are really, really rare are unlikely to have a huge amount of influence on what happens. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, sometimes you you can simplify your model by by grouping cells in in uh, categories, you know. So I think the complexity is very big and daunting when you don't understand what is happening. But as you start understanding a few of these things, you might end up having a simplified version of the model that would be, you know, uh, it would be possible to simulate it within a reasonable amount of computational resources. But of course, uh, permit COE is there, so we're not scared. If if it's too big, we'll just send it on the supercomputer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Vera. And then uh, last but not least, so if you want to learn how to send these things to, to the supercomputer, you can come to the to the permit COE summer school at the end yeah. of June. It's gonna be close to Barcelona and we are gonna yeah, show how to how to run some simulations in supercomputers and how to use the different uh, software tools that the uh, permit is uh, optimizing and scaling up. So I think that's it for today. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending. I hope you enjoy the webinar and see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.